The Fermi Paradox, Part 24. Poning Noobs at the End of Time. Where is everybody? In my research for this topic, I have encountered many possible solutions to the vexing question posed by Enrico Fermi all those years ago, some more plausible than others. But not until this week have any made me double take. As regular viewers of my channel know, I prefer to research my topics fully before putting them into writing. But sometimes one just has to bite the bullet and admit there's no precedent for what you've just seen, and that more facts aren't going to help you. And if there's one thing to be said for the solution proposed last month by futurist Anders Sandberg, Stuart Armstrong, and Milan Cirkovich, it has certainly never been proposed before. So, fair warning, this is going to be by far my most opinionated episode to date. And, rightly or wrongly, I do have some fairly strong opinions about this. So how exactly have these three fellows answered Papa Enrico's challenge? Well, they argue that the reason we can't see any aliens is because they're all asleep and will remain so until the last stars burn out trillions of years from now, whereupon they will awake and presumably live long, fulfilling lives in the endless blackness of the eternal void. Just like me, at this point you're probably asking something along the lines of, why? Or perhaps, what? Fret not, I ask both. It is puzzling, to say the least, that any civilization would be tempted to hibernate, or as the paper puts it, astivate, through the era of the stars, in that it also comprises the era of life, beauty, science, exploration, natural history, and in fact anything else of any conceivable interest to the sapient mind. But to the writers of this paper, all such concerns are subservient to one overriding goal. More efficient computing. You see, computations can be done far more efficiently at lower temperatures, and once the universe reaches its lowest ambient temperature, the energy efficiency of computation will be vastly improved, by as much as 10 to the 30. What's a waterfall or photosynthesis compared to that? I mean, do you have any idea what that would do to the League of Legends leaderboard? The graphical fidelity alone would be through the roof! To be clear, I in no way assume that this paper is intended to be taken entirely seriously, partly because it was published on Archive, the publisher that is to nature what eBay is to Sotheby's, and partly because of its overt references to H.P. Lovecraft. The paper's title even quotes the Nefandus Necronomicon, that is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Thing is, they seem to have somewhat misconstrued Lovecraft's intent. Lovecraft didn't actually think that the ancient star gods awakening from their ebon tombs in the eldritch void and reclaiming the universe that was once theirs was a good thing. That said, the trio are accredited professors from Oxford and the University of Novisad, so their speculations are based on decent science. The rationale goes something like this. The longer a society survives, the less likely it is to face what the paper calls, quote, strong discounts. In other words, it is less likely to cash in its resources to combat immediate threats, as these would gradually fade and be replaced by ever more long-term concerns, in which it is increasingly prudent to invest. As other concerns fall away, the civilization begins to increasingly confront Landauer's principle, that any irreversible manipulation of information must lead to a corresponding increase in entropy. Cooling computers increases the number of calculations one can perform per unit of energy expended, and the coldest bath one could conceivably place a computer in, without having to artificially cool it, would be the cosmic microwave background, the fading echo of the Big Bang which currently thrums at a steady rate of 3 degrees above absolute zero. But in about 1.4 trillion years, the CMB will fall in temperature to about 10 to the minus 30 degrees above absolute zero, which could increase the number of possible calculations astronomically. Such calculations would require a slower energy expenditure, but time is an infinite resource, and if you can sleep, there's no limit to how much of it you can consume. One fact that may shed light on the author's reasoning is that they are all transhumanists adherence to a not particularly organized sect that believes that it is the destiny of humanity and, by extension, all other sapient life forms, to digitize our puny meat minds, merge with technology, and become immortal cybernetic quasi-gods. Some even imagine us inside a vast computer system, our minds existing only as code. Who is supposed to fix said system when it inevitably breaks down, I've never really understood. To transhumanists, the beauty of nature, the universe, and even reality itself would be secondary to the fractal infinity of ever-evolving beauties our cybernetic minds could construct. 
Who needs the universe when we can each have and mold our own? In the words of the authors, any society preparing to take such a long nap would have, quote, seen it all. They would have explored all the possibilities the universe could ever offer, and have only universes of their own devising to look forward to. Personally, I doubt that point will ever come. If mathematics, the framework on which we build all our understanding of the universe, has already been shown to be ultimately irresolvable, as per Kurt Gödel, then why assume differently for the universe itself? I mean, yes, stars and galaxies are ultimately fairly simple constructions that, given enough time, might be completely understood, even down to the subatomic level. But what about that seemingly bottomless well of complexity? Life. Or it's even more complex offshoot. Culture. The beauty of culture is that by the time you've reached anything approaching a proper understanding of it, it has already moved on. The greatest gift of reality is its inability to conform to our preconceptions. Why would we, or anyone else for that matter, confine ourselves to realities constructed entirely of the already known? As precedent for their speculation, the trio cite the work of Freeman Dyson, who, in his seminal 1979 paper, Time Without End, Physics and Biology in an Open Universe, speculated how human consciousness could survive as the gradual unwinding of the universe removed ever more resources from our reach. As planets, stars, and galaxies slowly faded, we would have to transfer our consciousnesses to long-lived, slow-thinking cosmic engines that could traverse the empty cosmos, keeping the candle of intellect burning at an ever-dimming glow. But Dyson saw this as a necessity, not a lifestyle option. We would only relinquish the joys of the setting sun once there were no more suns to set. One element of this hypothesis that certainly places it above many in its oeuvre is that it may be testable. Any hibernating, sorry, astivating civilization would need some way to conserve resources through their long nap, and so they would need to engineer the materials in their vicinity to be far more energy efficient. So if we could observe, across galactic distances, stars, black holes, or cosmic winds dissipating less energy than would be expected in nature, that could be an indication of a hibernating, sorry, astivating species. Of course, as the paper itself acknowledges, this hypothesis ultimately falls foul of the same trap that ensnares every cultural or societal answer to the Fermi paradox. Why would everybody do it? Sure, you could imagine one culture trying that route, maybe even most, but it only takes one refusenik to fill the galaxy with its noise, and said refusenik would find galactic conquest particularly easy given that all its potential competitors were asleep. The paper speculates around this by suggesting that hibernating, sorry, astivating cultures could employ automated defenses to see off any potential raiders, though one has to ponder at the possible unintended consequences. This video has not, I fear, been the most solidly researched I have ever done, and I hope to get back on firmer ground for my next video series, which will cover topics far less airy. Assuming, of course, that another bit of news doesn't derail me again. I hope to see you very soon.